from his home in County Clare. We're just delighted to have him. Um, and he's going to talk to us about his in, uh, kind of inspirational debut uh, book. So it's Hitching from Hope, uh, for Hope, sorry, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. So whenever I first caught sight of this, and this must be a number of months back, um, what first caught me um, was the title. And I thought in itself that was uplifting. And, and then I kind of got to realize that other people were describing it in much um, uh, greater depth as being um, hope and healing in troubled times, mm -hmm. which I thought was really intriguing. And I'm very much looking forward to learning more about that. Uh, by way of introduction, um, Rory has many strings to his bow and a vast array of accomplishments also. Uh, so he's a business graduate, he's a Fulbright scholar, he's um, a charitable uh, founder, um, an active campaigner, uh, a podcast host and now recently a best-selling author. Um, so this evening we're going to learn about his journey through Ireland in 2013 um, at the height of, of the recession and kind of considering the prospects of emigration, but also to learn of his work um, for the last 20 years as a social innovator. So there'll be plenty of opportunity uh, for discussion and we'd invite you all, you know, as, as we uh, learn of uh, a little bit more about Rory's story, um, to submit any questions in uh, the chat boxes. And we'll certainly try uh, to field those questions to Rory um, after his presentation. So um, there's plenty to cover. And um, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Rory to commence proceedings. So um, good morning, Rory. And, Hello, um, how are you doing? Good morning, good evening. Good, good, good. So I'll hand over to you and um, leave you to it and we're all ears. Thanks so much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening uh, to friends in Australia. Uh, good morning if you happen to be in Ireland or somewhere around these parts. Uh, as you can see, slightly different uh, setting here. The uh, it's uh, What time is it? It's five past eight in the morning. Still pretty dark. It'll probably get bright in the middle of this event. And the rain is no surprise coming here from the west coast of Ireland, La Hinge, County Clare. The rain is starting to pummel down pretty hard and I'm on top of a hill actually. Um, over to this side uh, is the coast. You can, I can see the beach and the sea and the Atlantic just about two kilometers from my house and we have a great view. It's actually spectacular. So if you're not, uh, if you can't quite place it, if you can imagine the cliffs of Moher, um, we're only about 10, 15 minutes um, south of there and it's an amazing part of the world actually. Um, but I have to admit, I am a little bit jealous. I wouldn't mind being in Sydney right now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting a bit cold, but you know, we'll try and keep toasty and snug. Um, so thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate your time, your ears, your eyes. Uh, welcome to um, Owen and everyone from the consulate and uh, well done to Irish Support Agency for Balias Balia. Um, it's a really great initiative and very grateful for, to Paul and the team for hosting me. Um, I was really struck by the ethos and the, the driving force behind not just the Irish Support Agency, but the initiative itself. Um, just that whole idea of caring for each other and the idea of well-being and minding each other. Um, it's something that has been close to my heart for at least 20 years or so. Um, I suppose I was lucky in my early 20s, I kind of realized that I really wanted to I felt drawn to that kind of work, the work in the community, and, and that led me down into working with young people. But particularly, I took an interest in mental health because I could see that there was a lot of challenges out there. There were a lot of issues around anxiety and depression and, and in, even suicide. Uh, and I know that Ireland, particularly in the realm of male suicide, but Ireland and Australia aren't that different in that regard. Um, but I think, you know, the whole area of mental health or just well-being uh, is just part of life as I've come to understand it. It's just part of who, what it means to be human. Um, but so too is supporting each other and caring for each other and looking after each other and having even the volunteer tourism that comes with that. Um, so I think like for me, you're all part of that and the fact that you've made time now to, to come around the the fire with me, even though you mightn't feel the fire, but you're probably warmer than I am. So, um, and I, I'm sure some of you are probably Australian, some Irish Australian, some Irish in Australia. And um, I'd encourage you, if you feel inclined to use the chat facility here on Zoom, or if you're watching on Facebook Live, 
you're more than welcome to use the comments there and we'll be keeping an eye on those for the next 45 minutes or so and welcome any questions but also reflections or comments um, and I'd love to know maybe who, who you are, where you are at the moment in the world, whether it be Sydney or elsewhere. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this whole kind of world of community has been pretty much my whole life for a long time now. And I've kind of founded and co-founded organizations and been involved in volunteerism. Um, I started out in, I'm originally from Coot Hill, County Cavan, and I'm not quite sure how I've ended up on the West Coast here, but uh, it was a kind of, I got blown around the, the world a little bit. Uh, I, I went to college in Scotland and spent time in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and then lived in Donegal for a time, Sligo, and then eight years in Dublin. And then two years ago, my wife and I uh, moved to the West Coast. And it's, it's an amazing part of the world. And community is such a strong part of living here. And it's one of the things that has attracted me to, to stay in here, just that there is that kind of real ethos in the air that people are looking out for each other, lending a hand. And the last, what can we say about the last um, nine or 10 months in the world, you know, um, many of us have been impacted in, in so many different ways. And, it, you know, it, I don't mean to try and speak to anyone's experience. It's been different for everyone and, and sad and isolating and challenging and painful for many people um, and then at times people have found a lot of good things uh, in in the times of pandemic like more time for friends more time for family more time for rest for reading for reflection for wondering what is it all about and uh, if you ever find out what is it all about and um, let me know use it use you can use the chat facility there for that the big life's big questions um, so yeah, for me, um, the this book took a number of years to write uh, and and finish and then edit. And to be on, quite honest with you, it was a slog. Uh, it was very, very, very difficult for me. I'm a kind of an active person. I'm always on the go. I'm not someone you imagine sitting there for what was thousands of hours laboring over a pen and paper. Well, what was a laptop really? And, and then I just made a hames of it, to be honest with you. And I had to rewrite it and start again, nearly quit, start again, nearly quit. And, you know, it's like so many things in life worth doing, the, the nearly quitting thing can be the thing that tests you and makes you grow as a person. And the thing that really got me to persevere with the book was that I felt, yeah, sure, there was a lot of my story in it. But ultimately, the bulk of the book isn't about me or my story. It's about Irish people. And you might say people everywhere, really, the, the struggles and the challenges that they were going through at a particular time in Ireland when a boom time Celtic tiger economy collapsed was massive recession from, say, roughly four or five percent unemployment to 15 percent unemployment overnight. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people emigrating, including to Australia. People here might know people that moved at that time or are maybe you're one of those people. Um, and a, tear, a time of great kind of flux and turbulence and tension and anger as well, and a kind of a gloomy time. And I suppose it was a gloomy time in my life as well, because I'd spent eight years building up this nonprofit organization. And it had been an amazing journey, really exciting, a huge adventure. And uh, the organization was doing great work with young people, still is, it still exists. Um, but after seven or eight years, I was just burnt out. I was really no few left in the in the fire and just feeling very fatigued and you might say even depressed and certainly a bit lost in myself. And I decided to kind of leave the organization and to explore what might come next for me. And so that coincided with this time that Ireland was also a bit lost. And at the time, the president of Ireland, um, Michael D. Higgins, had appointed me to the Council of State, which is a it's an advisory constitutional advisory body. It's a kind of an honorary role, really, that it has a small function uh, periodically to when the president convenes a meeting to advise him on the constitutionality of a piece of legislation. But it's very, very, very rare. Uh, but at the same time, it's an honorary platform for me in that 
there was only seven people appointed uh, and there was another maybe 14 or 15 other members around about that number that included the Taoiseach or what's the equivalent of Prime Minister, the President and really sort of a lot of the former uh, and current leaders of the state and then I was there in, in somewhat of a kind of community perspective and like a voluntary role but still it probably gave me a voice and an opportunity as well to, to kind of create a platform or, or to uh, highlight issues. And I'd been asked a lot to go on radio and, and speak about where Ireland was at at that time. And the truth is I didn't really know what the answer was because I was kind of feeling that it was going through that time in my own life. And that's what kind of led to this notion of going around Ireland and, and asking people about hope. And originally I didn't even think it was about hope. I just wanted to go and ask people where they were at. And then I realized, oh, maybe this is about hope. and yeah, then I, I just came up with the idea, to, uh, well, the Hitchin thing really, it's not the obvious uh, solution to anything, is it? It's not, you don't start immediately going, well, I know what I'll do, I'll, I'll go Hitchin. But it, it came about because I was trying to go, well, how can I go around the country in a meaningful, practical way and meet people in an unplanned way where they might talk to me and tell me stories and that kind of thing? And I'd grown up, like many Irish people, particularly in rural Ireland, Hitchin was just such a normal way of getting around. And um, it's just how you got from A to B. And it was a time when life was a little bit quieter. Not everyone had two cars, that kind of thing. And But I hadn't Hitch in years. And uh, I knew that maybe it was... a maybe there was something in it and there was just a bit of madness in the idea. And I thought, well, maybe I'll give that a go, you know? So that's what happened. And then I ended up going on this thing. I call it Hitching for Hope. And I called it a listening tour. And the reason I called it a listening tour is even though I'm talking away here, um, I, was, I was focused way more on listening to people rather than talking to people and feeling that so often people aren't necessarily listened to, particularly when it, in the political realm, uh, I feel strongly that, you know, in order to have good politics and good governance, governance, we need politicians to be connected to people and we need leaders to be connected to people and they need to be out and about listening, doing more, more listening than talking. And it's only in that way you can lead or represent. And it wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a politician or anything like that, but I was kind of just trying to understand and then use whatever platform I had for change. So um, I'm going to read a couple of passages, uh, if that's okay. And generally, I've done a lot of these events. So the book came out last March and the week it came out, um, the bookshops closed. <laughs> and uh, They've remained closed for about 50% of the time. So talk about an interesting time to launch a book about hope when half the people can't buy it or truth is you can buy it online, you know, and, and then the shops did open. And, but thankfully, it became a number one bestseller fairly quickly and it's continued to do fairly well. Um, but at the same time, I've needed to work hard to get it out there, let people know about it. And as I said, I, I kind of believe in the voices and the stories in the book. And that's what's really spurring me on and driving me on. Um, and so I've done about 20 events around the world, zooming around the world from my fireside here. And I may actually, uh, I'm just checking on the fire. If you see the fire going out, will you just let me know so I can put more fuel on it? Uh, and... Um, yeah, I've done events in, um, geez, where have I been? Um, the Netherlands, Hungary, South Africa, a um, few in England, London, Northampton, uh, Chicago, um, Philadelphia, Boston, um, New York. So, uh, yeah, all over the world, really, and uh, three different Irish embassies involved. And it's it's been amazing. It's, I love it. I love it. Um, first of all well the other thing is there's not much else to be doing at the moment uh like i've plenty of work on but uh we're still in a lockdown here and it's like you know groundhog day um it's one lockdown to the other and anyway that's a whole nother conversation and um fair play to australia and australians for navigating your way around that in a, in a more efficient way perhaps uh but i know it hasn't been easy as well um, but we're stuck in a kind of a 5k radius and I know five, our 5k's are amazing. I have two small towns beside me and beaches and all the rest. So I'm okay. But to be able to zoom around the world is, is fantastic because 
just making life a bit more exciting and allowing me to connect with people. And Paula used the word connection. Um, it's so important, you know, particularly when we're not getting to meet friends and family here as much as we like. You can't do the hug and all that kind of stuff. You know, you go outside, you wear your mask, can't meet every the pubs are closed, cafes are closed. And so connection is what makes the world go round. People say money makes the world go round. And yeah, there's a there's a certain truth to that. Um, uh, but love makes the world go round. Connection makes the world go round. Like, who are we if we're not connected to each other, to our family, to our friends, to our community? And the Irish have always been great at community and community building. And that's why the likes of uh, the work that Balias Balia and the support agency and the consulate and embassy are so important. Keep the connections alive and keep us talking to each other and, and keep us, you know, meeting up with each other. So I, I consider these like a gathering, you know, a virtual gathering. Um, so anyway, without further ado, so I'm going to talk for maybe, we'll do a bit of reading for what, another 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and then I'll take any questions you might have. And again, I'd encourage you to use the chat and I'll see Marion's there in the Sunshine Coast, Queensland. How are you, Marion? Thanks for joining in. And thanks to, who else do I see? I see uh, Diane Heffernan, uh, Julie, Marion, Sarka, you're all very welcome. And I will, if you bear with me, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna throw a bit of something on the fire here. And if you watch closely, you'll see my lovely slippers. <laughs> They're very glamorous altogether. That's that job done anyway. So you can see, obviously, it's getting brighter outside and you can see a bit of uh, County Clare out the back and um, just on the hills there uh, that would behind that would be Doolan and you're entering the kind of Burren region, which is world renowned. Um, if you're not familiar, go to Google, go to Google Images, type in the Burren or La Hinch uh, and you'll see pictures there. Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll try and read um, a little passage here now. Um, where am I? Uh, yeah, I'll just read um, a little bit of the backstory about Hitchin. Um, just, I, I, I mentioned before um, about what Hitchin was to me in my life growing up, and obviously then I hadn't hitched in many, many years. But for me, there was a kind of a certain philosophy attached to it, and perhaps it could be a metaphor for other aspects of life. So I'll read this passage now at the start. Um, it's, it started off when I started hitching, I was very, very young because I was being bullied on a bus uh, home from school. And I started hitching my way home from school. Um, so I'll read this bit. Um, Community spirit was a prominent feature of life in decades past. In part out of necessity, people either stuck together or perished alone. Neighbours often helped each other through the mehel, the old Irish term for work sharing. My grandmother used to tell us stories about the neighbours who helped build her family's house. Offering the same kindness in return, my grand's family would pitch in with the farm work so the wheel of reciprocity and interdependence kept turning. Hitchhiking always felt to me like a natural part of this web of interconnectedness. It exemplifies that sense that we're all in it together, that we can pick someone up when they need help as it might be us or someone we know who needs help tomorrow. I experienced this every Saturday morning during my teens when I hitchhiked 24 kilometers from Coot Hill to Cavan to play rugby. I'd usually end up walking or waiting half an hour or more before getting a lift and the same on the way back, but I thought nothing of it. In an era before smartphones or the internet, it was as if I had all the time in the world. In later years, hitching opened up the world to me when I traveled in Scotland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and West Africa. I gained insight into other people and cultures and developed confidence, conversational skills, and the capacity for trust. Times changed though, and as years passed, hitching slowly disappeared from my life and seemingly from the world around me. The more money I earned, the lazier I became, opting for comfort and convenience over the occasional hardships of thumbs out travel. As the Irish economy blossomed, people bought cars and public transport improved somewhat. Urbanization, individualism, and the pressures of modern life also set in, and with these, hitchhiking faded into the past. The demise of hitching was aided by movies and news reports that pushed a particular narrative suggesting hitchhikers might be dangerous people. 
or that they themselves stood a good chance of being attacked by opportunistic drivers. I wasn't entirely immune to the fear factor. I understood that safety could be a concern, especially for women. My experiences as a man could not compare, a sobering reminder that all, not all is equal and just in the world. I'd encountered a few creepy drivers myself over the years, and while I managed to get away with them by trusting my gut and asking to be dropped off early, these kinds of experiences had left me more skeptical, cynical, and cautious than desired. Keeping an open heart was important to me. I always loved that line from the Edgar Guest poem, Faith, that reads, strangers are friends that someday may meet. I'd seen, though, how easy it was to become closed off in order to protect myself. When I told people of my plans to hitch around Ireland, common responses included, aren't you afraid of being murdered and nobody hitches anymore? Whether hitchhiking was dead or not was a valid question and one I was keen to investigate. I didn't doubt that dangers existed, but I was, wasn't fully convinced that people were now too busy, mistrustful or selfish to bother giving lifts. I liked the idea of challenging conventional wisdom of putting my thumb out to the nation to see what it stood for. In doing so, I would be reconnecting with my youthful openness, healing old wounds and inviting my country to reveal itself. So that's uh, some of the story. I'm going to whiz along here and uh, maybe tell you, uh, just bring you along the road here. So I ended up going, starting out in County Galway, then on up to, um, where did I go? Inishboffin Island on the first night, back in through Mam Cross, up to Mayo, Climb Crow Patrick, up through Sligo, Donegal, Derry, bumped into the 12th of July there where the orange marches were on, then on down to Dublin, uh, Kildare, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, Limerick, right up through the middle to through the Midlands, camped out on the hill of Ishnach on the last night, and then more or less finished, uh, well, actually finished in Donegal, but towards the end of the trip, the president, just completely random timing, convened a meeting of the Council of State, and I ended up having to go and prepare for a meeting of the Council of State at the president's home, which is called Oris and Uchtaran, which people might be aware of. Um, so there's a bit about that in the book as well, um, and a little bit of history in that regard. So I'll read a bit now of uh, some of the voices I was hearing along the way. This is the voice of a young farmer. Um, and there was a lot of, um, there was well, still is a lot of strong feeling around rural neglect in Ireland. And the fact that people, many people would feel that there's an overemphasis and focus on urban Ireland. And it's probably the same in Australia and the same in the US and elsewhere that rural people feel often neglected and particularly farming communities. And um, at that time, there was a lot of hardship and there was a lot of suicides in the community as well. And I talking to these farmers was such rage and anger. And keep in mind that at the time, Ireland had the world's most expensive banking bailout, which in many ways were still repaying. And you know, people in many ways were right to feel angry. And this is one voice. Um, so a lot of the anger, a lot of farmers didn't want to talk to me. They were quite angry and they were wondering who the hell's this guy and all that kind of stuff. So um, within seconds, I made, I, this is in a mart, by the way, uh, full of sheep and, and cattle and kind of hectic environment and, and very different environment. Within seconds, I made eye contact with a young farmer who had I briefly greeted earlier. He had kind eyes that made him easy to approach. No, I don't mind talking at all, he said. It's a strange day for me. I'm here with my brother and he's selling the last of his animals. He'd worked in construction and farming most of his life, this young man. Many of his friends had emigrated and he said he too was out of work and facing pressure to leave. He had separated from his wife and his children were the only things stopping him from emigrating. It would break your heart to leave them. I feel trapped and there's no way out. My eldest has already started talking about emigrating. That's how bad things are around here, he said. It's such emotion that I thought he was going to cry. My heart went out to him in that moment. I wanted to empty all my pockets and to give him whatever money I had to hug him and to tell him to keep going. He probably had done, he could probably have done with that hug, but I just couldn't bring myself to, to offer it against what would probably powerful inhibitions wrought by cultural and social conditioning and reluctant to leave him without at least offering some support I asked how he was coping it's hard to be honest he said I might not be able to cope if it wasn't for antidepressants but really it comes down to my children 
I want to be there for them. I know how it sounds a bit corny, but I get hope from my children, from my love for them. I hadn't expected him to share such a harrowing tale, but I detected in him a strength that assured me he'd be okay, that he had something to hold on to. I love to keep him going that was positive and equally important. He was able to open up and articulate his situation. I thought back to the social conditioning that had deterred the hug. I'd seen time and time again how cultural norms around masculinity prevented men, including myself, from communicating and expressing ourselves in healthy ways. The boys don't cry fallacy. It's a travesty that has caused too much hurt. If this young farmer was barely hanging on, I could only imagine how tough it must have been for all those over the years who kept their pain bottled up, who attempt to drink it away, to find themselves willing to end their own lives. Fathers separated from the children, as this farmer might end up particularly affected. I'd met several over the years. I found myself thinking too of the pain of emigration. If all those who left Ireland over the centuries for Boston, Chicago, Liverpool and Melbourne, what hardships, sorrows and regrets had they taken with them? Not all of them, mind you. I know that emigration is a, is a, a multi-layered thing. Um, emigrant success stories are often well documented. What I wondered about the others, the drinkers in Philadelphia, the homeless in London. I thought of all the stories that will remain untold, all the people who might never find words to express their devastation. I told the man that I could see he was an amazing father and that I suspected the future would bring good things for him. My heart was heavy as I prepared to leave Mam Cross, but I took comfort in the great strength amid adversity I'd observed in the men in the mart. It felt like they had an ancient spirit, an ancient strength, one that had carried their ancestor through even harder times. There was a dignity in these men, a fierce love of the land and a sense of community that suggested they would stand firm against the rush to so-called progress. Um, so, um, yeah, as I said, emig emigration is, is a, a multi-layered thing and everyone's experience of it is quite different. Um, and yeah, just when I, when I was speaking that there, I was reminded the fact that this is an Australian event and a large part of my family history is connected to Australia as well in that my own family emigrated to Perth when I was 11 and we ended up spending a year there before returning home. It just didn't work out. Um, but yeah, if things had gone differently, I would be, well, I wouldn't be here, would I? <laughs> but I'd have a bit of an Aussie accent at this stage, I'd say. Uh, and uh, I've been back to Australia multiple times. I spent a year there um, in my early 20s after college. And um, I love the place. I think it's a wonderful country. And I love the, the Irish history there as well. Particularly, I always loved the history around the Eureka Stockade and the Eureka Rebellion and the Irish role there. Um, and I suppose one of the, the prouder aspects of my connection is my uncle, the late Jim McKiernan, who died a couple of years ago, was a senator in the Australian Parliament for, I think, 17 years. Um, and he's a guy who got bullied ferociously by Christian brothers at school in Cavan, left school when he was about 15, went to England, got a trade, um, went to Australia when he was very young, and got well, he was married at the time, a uh, young child, um, uh, joined the, the trade union movement and then from then on the, there was a connection with the Labour Party and they asked him to run for Parliament and he served Western Australia and he was a great kind of Irish champion in Australia and uh, so I still have lots of relatives in Perth and, and connections around Jim and it's nice to keep his memory alive and the connection alive as well. So I'll read one more passage. Uh, let me see now where I'll go. Um, we will go, we will go where? Um, I'll jump along and um, I'll do the, the Wolf of Hope story um, and then I'll do one more quick one. These are shorter ones. Um, so this is a young Polish couple. There's a lot of Polish people who live in Ireland and um, a lot of people you'd meet think maybe they don't really have anything to say about hope or society, but my feeling is that everybody has something worth saying and that it's just a case of saying it or hearing it. And that's what happened in this story when this young couple picked me up. Now, most of this trip, it was actually quite sunny. 
um, but it was it was really lashing rain this day. So yes, it's great weather, as you can see, joked her boyfriend. I like it a lot here, the woman remarked. Ireland is so beautiful and uh, really friendly. The people are really friendly. Most people are, she added. But you know, I don't like talking about politics and the future all that much. I just do my job as a waitress, meet my friends and try to do things the best way I can. Th keep things simple. So I'm probably not a good person to talk to about your trip, she concluded. That only encouraged me. I believe everyone has wisdom to share and stories to tell, so I wasn't going to let her get away with things that easily. Sure enough, she was a qualified psychologist with an interesting perspective on the human mind. As I said, I like to keep things simple. Life doesn't need to be so complicated. So much of the negativity around us is from watching the news and believing too much that politics is the only reality. I know it's important, but it's not the total reality. Reality is whatever you make it for yourself. It's like that story of the two wolves. Do you know the one? She asked. I told her I wasn't familiar with the story. Well, it's an old Cherokee story, a Native American story, she said. A grandparent is telling their grandchild that there are two wolves fighting for control of our minds. One is filled with fear, envy, greed, anger, hate. The other is loving, kind, humble, peace loving and generous. The grandchild becomes worried and wants to know which wolf is going to win. The grandparent says, the one that will win control of your mind is the one that you will feed. Now, far from not having anything to say, this woman had shared with me one of the most powerful stories I'd heard in the trip so far, one that I wish the entire nation could hear. That myth, sum, that, that myth, myth <laughs> sums up so much for me, she concluded. She end. There's a battle for our minds from within and without. And ultimately, it's up to us to be clear about our response to that. So I love that story. And I, I wrote in it that at the time, I remember thinking that's a, just a tiny little story. And it, for me, it boils down so much around the choices that we have around our own minds and our own perspectives of how we see the world. I know that um, you know, your environment has a lot to do with your peace of mind as well and, and the society and community you live in. Um, but I suppose I'd be an advocate for things like meditation and mindfulness and, and ways of helping you kind of navigate the inevitable storms of life. And um, yeah, so when I said I, I'd like to share the story, at the end of the trip, I got asked on to the Marion Fanukin radio show, which at the time was the biggest radio show in the country. And that was at the end of the trip. And they asked me, um, is there any stories that come to mind that you'd like to share? And I remember just thinking back, this is one. So I, I actually told that story live on air to, I don't know, half a million people or whatever, like, you know, the equivalent of 10% of the country ended up because of this woman told it, it was nothing to do with me. Um, well, it was, but it was her story, but it was an ancient story as well. So, you know, I suppose I, I, I kind of feel like stories are, are, are filled so often with wisdom and messages for us in life and by exchanging stories we can take different things and they can change shape so that's why i think books are important and why i think it's important to have storytelling events and to learn from hear each other's stories about life um so i'll read one more and then um we'll see about the questions if you have any uh, again i'll remind people you're free to use the chat facility on zoom or comments on facebook live and if you do need to leave early, the book is Hitching for Hope, uh, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. Uh, and it's available as paper book, ebook, and audio book, including in Australia. Uh, you could ask your local bookstore if they have it, or booktopia.com.au has it in, in Australia. And a very bigger website retailers have it as well. And I have some, I don't know if we can still post things to Australia now, not sure about that, but I have some signed copies as well on my website. So all the links to that uh, are at www.hitchingforhope.com. Hitchingforhope.com. I see Diane is joining in here from Boston in the United States. And if anyone is familiar with time zones, it is 3.30 in the morning. So Diane wins the award here for, uh, I thought uh, that's gas. Fair play to you, Diane, for joining in. 
and uh, and your dad's family's from Galway. Brilliant. So there's loads of Galway in the book, and my mother lives in Galway now, and my granny's from Galway. Um, and I'll be doing more American events in the next couple of weeks. I've one in Washington, D.C., so the same time zone for you, Diane, and another in San Francisco then. And there's links to those at hitchingforhope.com. I see a question from the consulate there. Uh, I will get to that after I read perhaps one more passage. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, maybe we'll move into the questions and then maybe we'll see if we have time for one more. Um, so I'll take that question first and then I'll see if Paula has a couple of questions. So I'll summarize the book and just say that there's a whole gambit in there. There's, there's the whole spectrum of human story of people that suffered, you know, whether it be marital breakdown, uh, job loss, losing their home, going through hard times in life, and then also overcoming hard times and people's perseverance and resilience and strength and courage and the power of community uh, that is so strong that is the book is very much a celebration of that. And within that, a quest and a desire amongst so many people I met for simplicity, for a more simple way of being and a sense that happiness can be found through simplicity, through simple ways of, of living and quieter, slower ways, perhaps. And I think that's something that many people are learning these days. Um, yeah, um, I got lifts everywhere I went. People looked after me, people put me up. And I suppose the, the whole notion of kindness was so strong and, and shunned through. And, and all of those very basic, fundamental human values shun true so strong and they're the things that gave me and still give me hope and that i believe people are fundamentally decent and good and sure some people lose their way or some people are off on a different track but you know people are fundamentally good and they need to be given opportunities for good but also we need to emphasize and celebrate the goodness as well i think um so uh, the question, uh, Lahinch, even in the rain, lockdown sounds fabulous. Yeah, it is. Uh, actually, it's a beautiful day. Actually, yeah, it's clearing up now and I can see the sea just out to the side in the distance. Um, it's often said that this pandemic will be particularly hard on young people missing out on experiences, um, less jobs and exams uncertainty. From my experiences with Spun Out, which is the organization I founded, um, what can we do to support them? And what do you think is, will the impact be? And that's from Owen, the Consul General in Sydney, Owen Feeney. Thanks, Owen. Um, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Um, like being young is a fragile time in anyone's life. You know, you're trying to make your way in the world. You're trying to understand your place in the world. And um, I think we can never offer enough time for young people. Like if, if you want to boil it all down to just a very basic thing, I think time and society in many ways is time deficient. And we're all sort of have to be here and do this and emails and all the rest. But to just make time to hang out with young people and to listen to them and then to invite them into the into the conversation, into the room, into decision making as well, whether it be a board of directors, an advisory board, an advisory council um, to create events and spaces for them that are led and guided by them and with them so that we don't think we always know best for them because um, you know life changes, technology changes, needs change. Um, and I think it's important to co-create things with young people. So spunout.ie, um, what was co-created with young people, still is, it's still doing a great job. I'm no longer involved, but it, it does great work. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, yeah, they're going to certainly miss out on, on key milestones and rites of passage, if you like. But, you know, I also think about grandparents' generation, my parents' generation. Life wasn't, it's never been easy throughout history. I don't want to like simplify it or, or, you know, diminish it, the struggle in any way. But like people have to come of age in different ways and different times and, perhaps we can guide and support young people to seize the whatever good they can find in the moment, you know? Um, yeah, and, and, and I think like we do need a better policy response um, state level, government level, that there's a greater emphasis, particularly in Ireland. And we've so often overly relied on the safety valve of emigration that 
we just open up the tap and let our, all our young people out off all over the world. And then we say, well, it's not that bad because most of them will return. That's debatable, you know. Um, many will return, many will not. Many wanted to go, many did not want to go. Um, but we should have a functioning state that doesn't uh, require emigration in order to function. There are many positives to emigration and the experience of bringing back learning and growth and global connections. But we should be able to develop a state and a republic and a society that has adequate health, housing, um, education and job creation. And a lot of that for me comes down to belief and vision and the notion that we can do it and we will do it and the determination to do it. So I think we need to be a bit bolder and stronger and more imaginative in our, in our hopes for Ireland and indeed our hopes for the world. And that can be, you can take that onto climate change or any other number, whether it be racial inequalities, gender inequalities, um, the issues around native indigenous peoples and the healing that's required all over the world um, in the in the US, Australia, wherever else, Canada. Um, I think just, you know, there's always work to do. And I was just watching the inauguration yesterday and it's it's just about keeping keeping the flame alive and believing that change is possible. Um, I got a very um, negative, cynical email just before I came on air onto this call. Somebody just really, <laughs> who's not a fan of me and that's fair enough. Um, and it was just full of um, cynicism, really. And, and I understand why that might be the case. Um, but if we, I remember Michael D running for president and somebody said something to him on radio and he said, I ah, give up your old cynicism. Because uh, we used to have that term, give up your old sins. But cynicism is such a corrosive force. I, I don't mind, you know, being cautious or even skeptical or even cynical, but cynical, it doesn't allow for much hope, you know, and it doesn't allow for decency and it doesn't allow space. So I think just allow space to be hopeful is such an important thing in the world right now to believe that change is possible. And as, as Martin Luther King said, you know, that I can't quote it correctly perhaps, but something like the, the arc of history is long and it bends towards justice. Um, and I, we are making progress in the world. We're doing, making a mess at the same time ecologically and otherwise, but, but there is a lot of good stuff happening. And I'd like to think that we're, we're making, we're on the right track, you know, but, but that requires leadership. And I think too often we wait for leadership from the corridors of power when traditionally the greatest power in the world comes from people, um, not just as voters, but as civic leaders, whether it be through organizations like the Irish Support Agency in Australia or any number of voluntary groups throughout Australia, whether it be mental health, young people, sports, culture, arts, the whole variety. And even just on a one-to-one -one level, we can create change. You know, Mother Teresa said that just about the idea that we create change one-to-one, -one, one person at a time. It doesn't need to be big and shiny and glorious. Um, so, yeah, I, I am hopeful for young people, but I do think that empathy that you've expressed, Owen, is, is important and it does need, I'm not hearing that much of that empathy and that's certainly required. Um, but I think job creation and platforms and opportunities are so important and fundamental. Um, I see a question there from Coffs Harbour um, from... Uh, that might be Lisa, is it? I'm not sure. I can't fully see the name. Uh, looking forward to buying the book. Human stories and overcoming adversity can be so helpful to hear, to put one's life in perspective. The pandemic has certainly given me time for much reflection, trying to be better with time management uh, when provided all the right information. Much to be done around equity and equality, however. Spot on. Yeah, um, it's a huge time of reflection. Um, when things are, you know, I think it's often attributed to Mar Marilyn Monroe, uh, a quote about, what is it? Things fall apart so other things can come together. Now, I don't know if she did say that or someone else said that, but the sentiment can apply anywhere. You know, that within a crisis can be an opportunity, within suffering can be the potential for a new ways for new ways of thinking for new ways of being and whilst the world's going through a profound
crisis and upheaval at the moment, I like to think that it could be a period of reimagining and that we can, it's not like pre-pandemic, everything was going hunky-dory. <laughs> there were like fundamental, serious, urgent challenges. So perhaps this can be a tipping point and a turning point for the good, for the positive. But again, that choice is so fundamental in that as to the, the choices that we make in any given moment. Um, but the period of reflection, I think, is important. It's no harm to get off the treadmill every now and then and, and take a moment to pause to question who am I, where am I going, what do I want, what are my values. Um, Mirren has joined us from Dublin. Good morning, Mirren. Mirren, um, Kid Mila Falja. So, Paula, are you, let me see if Paula is there now and I'll try and get her up on screen if she has a question. Thanks for staying with us, folks, uh, everyone on Zoom and on Facebook Live. It's great to have your your presence here. I'm really grateful for it. And uh, hopefully we'll connect in person at some point along the way, whenever that might be. Um, uh, you're muted there, Paula. Indeed. Yeah, you're, I'm indeed. You're uh, thanks, thanks for that, Rory. Um, there's many kind of facets in, in your story that I would like to um, to kind of poke a little bit under, but uh, they're not necessarily connected. But um, one of the ones was um, in relation to, if I take you back to the start of this particular journey um, and you were down in the kind of in the dumps yourself and feeling a little bit lost, um, in your initial plan, did you have a clear vision as to what you wanted to achieve? Like, did you have a roadmap, a time frame, um, or did it develop, you know, did, did, did did it develop as you, did you wing it basically? Oh yeah, and, totally uh, winged it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, intentionally winged it, you know. Um, you know, because from uh, when you work in business or even in nonprofits, the, the tendency is to have a strategy and a plan and quite rightly so, because you don't really want to be involved in serious work without any kind of strategy or plan. And particularly when there's money involved and people involved. But there are times for winging it. And particularly, you know, when I wasn't necessarily trying to prove anything to anybody and I had permission and freedom to, to just go with the flow. And in, in fact, that became the strategy was to go with the flow and see where the flow took me. And I think like life can bring us in very interesting directions in that regard. So the, you can have a life plan, for instance, but, you know, as, as there's an old saying, like, if you want to give God a laugh, tell God your plans. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you need to believe in God or anything like that, but you get the picture. Um, you know, did anyone, did you ever plan to move to Australia when you were 10? You know what I mean? It's it's kind of, maybe you did, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, life takes twists and turns and, and sometimes they're not, not great turns and twists, but sometimes they are. And I think, you know, just to allow a bit of like... Uh, I, I'm quite interested in um, the Taoist philosophy and the ebbs and flows and to consciously work with the ebbs and flows. So that's manifested in the Tai Chi practice, you know, this kind of idea of like this, you know, that life is a bit of a river. And But I think the important thing in that is to, to try and um, enjoy the enjoy sailing on the river, you know, and enjoy the view on the river because it is all going to be over before we know it. Um, you know that that it's going very fast it's it might some days feel like a slow mo moving river but then you know your 10 years have passed and 20 years have passed and so as, as somebody once said we're here for a good time not a long time <laughs> very good very good i'm glad to hear that because i, I similarly think that I'm, I'm visualizing um a scenario where you've got your lift you're arriving into a small community town i'm sure you must have met loads of characters um, along the way but Obviously, um, it was a very, very difficult time. I and mean, you mentioned kind of rural stuff. If I was in Ireland at that stage, 2013, and there was a big kind of divergence between those who are working in the private and public sectors and, and things of that nature. So it was kind of um, a very difficult time. But look, as, as you came into these communities and, say, and met some of the characters, I'm just kind of trying to figure out how you developed your relationships such that they, they were you know, felt comfortable opening up to you and, yeah. and um, sharing their stories? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I um, 
I did a bit of work last year with a global organization. Uh, it's kind of Irish American organization called Narrative Four, and they have this methodology that it's rooted in theater practice. It's called a story exchange. And so it would be the equivalent to all of us together sitting in a circle. And then me and Paula, you, we, you and I would pair up and everyone else would pair up. And then you would tell me your story, Paula, about like on a theme such as courage or hope, you know, and that could be a story about your family, your work, your business, whatever. And then I'd tell you my story. And then I would then become Paula and relay your story back to the group. Anyway, the whole point, it's a kind of an interesting, quirky uh, methodology but the moral of this story is that by somebody sharing their own story it creates permission for someone else to then reciprocate or trust you know and it's about kind of creating the space to to trust each other because quite often we're a bit kind of closed off and maybe cautious around each other and sometimes rightly so the world isn't always that straightforward and um, but for me, I just kind of telling people a little bit about who I am, what was going on and what I was at. Eventually, well, actually, I had to figure that out pretty quickly. because <laughs> I, I remember getting in the first car uh, that I got a lift and then um, I was going, feck, how am I going to explain myself here? <laughs> uh, and so I did it anyway. But I think people can pick up. You may not need to be the most articulate, but people can pick up when you're you're being sincere and there's a degree, there's something about when you share a bit of vulnerability around yourself that people can go, okay, now I can share a bit of my vulnerability. And they feel they're kind of in safe hands that you're not going to maybe exploit them or that kind of thing. So I think it's um, in community work, it's, it's where the focus on facilitation comes in. So I've done a lot of that kind of work before, but this is just organic where you're, I just think treating people with respect as well and being genuinely wanting to hear their story. And, and I think people can sense that from other people as well. Um, obviously I, I haven't had the opportunity to read the book myself, but I, I'm surmising that you have ended up in a good place in terms of you found um, the hope that you were essentially looking for at the, at the outset of, of the journey. Um, I'm just wondering, as your uh, mindset became more positive, were you able to bring people along with you in terms of if they were in a position that was a, um, was a little bit less optimistic than your own perspective halfway through the journey or think what did it give you confidence to to um, share and influence the thought processes of other people? Mm. That's debatable uh, because I wasn't really that wasn't the in, that wasn't the intention, you know, uh, I wasn't out to spread hope it was more find hope um but that being said um it, it was such a kind of quirky curious project that uh people kind of not everyone there's always going to be a bunch of people that are back to the cynicism thing or they're just going like that's a, that's ridiculous um what the hell does he think he's at and grand that's that's with everything in the world um, uh, but um, sorry I'm losing my train of thought here bear with me <laughs> um, oh yeah spread and hope yeah 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 sorry um, yeah a friend of mine texted me one day on that trip saying uh, there's a priest saying a mass somewhere in Cavan and he's talking about your trip from the altar and I was going like he thought this was hilarious uh, particularly referencing me from an altar uh, uh, and, you know, if it just, if the story became one to get people talking about hope or why would a guy do this? Or I think what might give people hope sometimes is that someone would listen to them. And um, that just by virtue of being heard and being listened to, like it's such an old cliche, but a problem shared is a problem halved. And I, I said it at the beginning that many people don't feel heard. And just the fact that someone might listen to their story and think it was important can create a lot of relief and space and possibly hope in people but it wasn't the intention to try and actively I think it's a dangerous thing actually to to try and actively sort people out sometimes because you're you know the, the road to hell is paved with good intention as they say so you need to tread carefully. 
I've just one other quick one, and um, I'm conscious that on a few occasions that you've kind of referenced listening to your inner voice at, at um, stages of your life, um, and directing you towards a particular path. And I'm just wondering, in terms, of what gave you the kind of the courage of conviction to follow a particular path? Because I suspect there's a lot of people here who are reconsidering options um, in the light of, of what's happening here, and. Um, the head v heart and and uh, things of that nature so it's like for in your case the listening to your inner voice um how how did you arrive at, at the, the confidence to follow that inner voice yeah uh well i suppose you probably have to come to a place where uh you're not finding the answers from the outer voice you know and that the outer voice being the world and all the noise of the world and the answers of the world, society's ideas, thoughts, and that you, maybe it's just a little bit about when you get a little bit older perhaps and you go, well, hang on, I need to kind of, and to be honest, we go back to education. I feel like that's something we can do for young people is help them to understand better their own perspectives, their own power, their own agency, their own sense of uniqueness the idea that they all have unique gifts, abilities, opportunities, potential. Um, so I had some of those opportunities when I was young, but like a lot of time I was just lost and being an idiot and drinking too much and, you know, wasting time. So there was an aspect of that, like in my mid twenties, then when I was founding a nonprofit, just going, oh my God, I've wasted a few years just acting the cod, but then that's good fun as well. So I don't know who's to say. Um, but I think really where some great growth and learning tends to emerge is when you go through a really, really hard time. And I suppose there were just some times when I went on some, some lows and went really downwards that I realized, okay, you need to kind of take some action here. And so I started doing some courses and, and then I went on retreats and then I ended up doing so, so uh, stereotypical, went to India to an ashram, you know, uh, <laughs> eat, pray, love. Uh, and then, you know, studied meditation in, in Dublin with Sister Stan and, and then have since become a kind of proponent or advocate for meditation as a very basic uh, resource, basic but profound resource that can help us. If, if life is a river or more like a sea and a wild sea, then it can help you steer your own course in a better way. And, and with that is to know thyself, as the old saying goes. Um, but how can you know yourself if you don't cultivate any kind of inner space in yourself? So for some people, they traditionally did that through religion. But, you know, there's other ways of doing it. You can do it through the arts. You can do it through music. But the, I do believe like a, some kind of cultivation of an inner space is is so rewarding and possibly essential as well. Um, rather than bumbling our way through life. And you can do very well that way as well, but um, I tend to believe that it's a more rewarding, well, it has been for me. I can only speak about myself, of course. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm just noticing here, there's a comment from Mirren in terms of, are you thinking of writing a second book? Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of wrote one uh, during the last lockdown. It's a bit of a lockdown memoir reflection on everything from everything from like thinking about home ownership to <laughs> to Donald Trump uh, and everything really and being stuck in stuck in a 5k lockdown and what that means. And, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do with it. If it's, I haven't had time to look at it. I've been so busy, to be honest, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, I see I, I'm doing more. Yeah, I, I'm going to finish up a few more events. Uh, I'm lucky that the Irish government's cultural agency called for a culture abroad called Culture Ireland are, are helping me promote these events around the world. So a few more days and then I'll kind of calm down and, and go back to that inner space place rather than the outer space and take a moment. Um, I see Dave is coming from Liverpool, England. So I did an event there at the Liverpool Irish Centre. Uh, and he's, uh, it's cool that there's people in a few different countries. Uh, what is he saying here? Sorry, Dave. Uh, he's talking about funding for the health and wellbeing clubs. 
Um, funding from individual clubs. Oh yeah, he's talking about the support that the Irish Embassy provides. Yeah, the Irish government does does some good work around the diaspora. And I would say like there's a lot more we could do in that regard, but it's great that the connections are being made. And it's great to see Grace in Tasmania. So we've got like a nice mix of people. We've got Mirren in Dublin, we've got Tasmania, we've got uh, Boston, um, I think we had Queensland. Uh, and then the question from Marion, um, when you were hitching around Ireland and speaking to so many different people from different, did you find that their balance tipped to hope or was there more desperation that people were feeling? Hmm. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's, it's like, I think both was true at the same time, but it's like there was a lot of desperation and anger and then you talk to people and then they almost process a lot of what they're going through and then it's almost like it's catalyzed and transformed even within minutes and they start to reflect and go oh yeah well you know what there's actually a lot to be grateful for and sure as long as you have your health and your food and and then people get perspective so that's it's kind of interesting that that where that reflective space brings us sometimes as well you know we like any one of us right now can think of 10 things to worry about um but our minds can quite often gravitate towards the 10 things to worry about versus the 10 things to be grateful for. Uh, and again, it's back to that kind of wolf of, wolf of hope analogy or, or story that was told. Um, somebody there, Sarka, Sarsha, uh, Sarka, sorry. Um, both parents were from Dublin. She was born in Australia. Uh, my wife told me not to try and put on an Australian accent for the crack, so I will not be doing that. Uh, appreciating and celebrating community and interdependence, uh, pushing back on the hype around rampant individualism and capitalism. We're returning to more communal ways of living, optimism and realism over cynicism any day, believing in the essential goodness of people when provided all the right information. Uh, yep. Yeah. I'm with you on all of that. Uh, so... I don't know how we're doing. We're due to finish up now. I'm going to put, uh, if you have a final couple of questions, I could take a couple of ones, uh, but I'm going to share a few social media links into the chat and the comments on Facebook afterwards. I'll do that afterwards. And again, it's hitchingforhope.com if anyone wants to check anything out or send me an email. You're more than welcome. I love hearing from people. And I have two different podcast series as well that you might enjoy as well called the Love and Courage podcast and Creative Souls of Clare. So, um, have we any other questions, Paula, or we, or do you have any concluding? I, I could talk all day. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. I certainly do not want to hog. I'm sure there's other people out there that um, have um, some thoughts or observations. You're on mute. Sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're kind of concluding here and I'm conscious of people's time and I want to say thanks for, for joining in and staying with us. The replay of this is available on the Irish Support Agency's Facebook page. Um, so you'll immediately get it straight away there. And if you want to share, tag friends or whatever, if you think they might be interested and um, yeah, I might do another one in Australia at some point in a, in a few weeks or months and ideally in person, to be honest, uh, it'd be great to do something in person, but sure, who knows what, what the next few months are for the world. But I want to just, um, again, say thanks to everyone, but also wish you all well and to, you know, just enjoy it all and um, enjoy the whatever um movement you have there that we don't have at the moment around you know i know you can't leave the country and things like that but um enjoy the weather uh enjoy each other and keep up the great work with the uh the irish support agency and and all the great work that consulate and everyone else is doing and thanks to culture ireland and thanks to you all for your time and energy and support and hopefully we'll get to cross paths in person and and give us a shout if you end up in these parts also at some point, you're more than welcome. 
Thanks so much, Maureen. Thanks, you know, on behalf of the Irish Support Agency, it's been absolutely delightful having you this evening. Um, from my perspective, um, there's lots of seeds of, of um, or food for thought there in terms of reflection and, and um, hope for 2021 and, and into the future and, and how, you know, expressing or kind of practicing gratitude is, is a big, big part of, of staying positive. So, um, listen, thanks a million for, for um, everything that you've done for us this evening and wish you all the best with the book and whatever else, whatever project you uh, decide to embark on next. I uh, wish you all the very best and thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a good day or a good evening. Good night. I can't remember what time zone I'm in right now. <laughs> <laughs> See you again. Bye-bye.